Welcome to New Game Plus. My name is Donald and I'm joined this week by Meg. How are you? Hello, I live here now. I feel like I'm here every week. Yeah, it's just, yeah, let's not pay attention to the continuity too much. Please pay attention to the continuity at home. <laughs> but we are coming off the back of Tokyo Game Show, the big game convention that takes place in Japan. And like half some of our crew are there and they have delivered so many good stories about that show. TGS gets like 100,000 people every day, which is nothing compared to the Western Expos we see here. No, yeah, like it is like those hallways are crowded, but it's just, it's bustling and it's positive and it's like it's a show sort of unlike any other even something like say PAX it just has a different environment like given the cosplayers that rock up to mm -hmm. Tokyo Game Show their cosplay game is just wowzers. We're not really talking about it because it's awesome it's set in Tokyo but half of our crew is actually was actually there and we talked to them about what they were looking forward to the most and what sets it apart from Western Expos but basically TGS Tokyo Game Show talks about all these games that will never ever come to the West like random no. dating sims and crazy Japanese games like Taiko no Tachijin, esports, they do panels, cosplay, but heaps of exciting stuff. Like the games I'm looking forward to are things like Project Left. Project, it's like Project Alive. Pr Project Live, no. Yeah. The Project Judge, Judge <laughs> I, which is the new game from um, the developers of Yakuza. So Correct. Like, it's kind of Yakuza like meets uh, Phoenix Wright. Correct. Like we got a first look of that like just like a week before Tico Game Show. But what like that game is probably the most promising out of the lot, and it's pretty fairly high standard as well. Exactly. Mm. They are excited to be there, especially because it's halfway across the world. But we also talk about in this episode Vicara Chronicles 4. And we also talk about Dragon Quest XI mm -hmm. as well as video game review scores and given Polygon's decision to eradicate the scores from their reviews. Is scoring still a thing? Let's find out in this mm -hmm. episode of New Game Plus. Enjoy, guys. As the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. In this current context, that axiom should ring true for Sega's very own Valkyria series, which has seen a few mainline and spin-off installments stray from the path thematically since its debut about a decade ago. After some experimentation that may or may not have paid off, depending on which fans you ask, 2018 will see the English release of a much anticipated return to form with Valkyria Chronicles 4 for the PS4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch and PC. Chronologically, Valkyria Chronicles 4 mostly falls in line with the first game in the series. While Galia are busy up north defending their homeland from invaders, this time you follow the trials and tribulations of Commander Claude Wallace and Squad E of the Ranger Corps within the Atlantic Federation. They are tasked with Operation Northern Cross, a mission that sends the Corps deep into enemy territory of the Imperial Alliance from the south border all the way to the far east. Closer proximity to the enemy stronghold means bigger battalions to intercept, stronger defences to breach, and higher stakes to overcome. Like the first game, the struggles between the Federation and Imperial forces serve as a blatant yet impactful allegory to the World War II, even if the anime aesthetic tends to occasionally bend the tone on grounds of juxtaposition. Good-natured banter between squad mates contrasts with what I'd consider some of the darkest moments in the series to date, as Squad E are caught in a never-ending nightmare of hardships that only get worse as they edge deeper into enemy territory. If I could point, uh, point out a few flaws within an otherwise lovely looking game, playing the Switch version sports some textures and objects like knee-high grass to be much lower in qual uh, quality than other games being released this day and age. Uh, Pre-rendered cutscenes are also a little sparse compared to the first game as most of the events transpire within visual novel style talking head segments. I mean, don't get me wrong, the dialogue is certainly good enough to convey its points, but it definitely implies that this game had a much smaller budget to work with compared to the first game. A few more action-oriented full-motion cutscenes detailing the more dire events of the war would have driven home a better sense of urgency that a high-tension operation staged behind enemy lines truly deserves. Though the biggest takeaway from Valkyria Chronicles 4 is the return to turn-based strategy following Valkyria Revolution's release. Units are placed among the field top-down like chess pieces on a board, and turns are taken to control them individually, occasionally going into a more intimately framed third-person mode to attack, flank, or capture choke points in missions. The approach Valkyria Chronicles 4 takes is fairly conservative, but this isn't necessarily a bad thing. 
potentials which can be passive buffs or debuffs, are now personalized depending on the unit, while squad members' preferences for working with other units change throughout the operation's tenure, providing a sense of organic matur maturation of each unit in the squad. The newly introduced class Grenadier is a range-centric powerhouse that could easily eclipse the utility of the anti-tank lancers, if not for their poor mobility and constitution, so this prevents upsetting the original class meta as much as they should. I mean, rest assured, you could still cheese through missions by completing them in one turn via some questionable methods that may or may not involve abusing a certain specific armoured personnel carrier, but at least the game demands that you earn that right by studying each operation thoroughly before you get into any form of grinding for experience or money. More changes include allowing leaders to pair up with other units simultaneously at a reduced command point cost, along with the last stand function, where you can choose to either counter-attack, temporarily buff a nearby unit, or make one final push before that soldier is incapacitated on the field. These add an extra dimension to more aggressive playstyles like mine that the developers feel pretty intense on accommodating. Map design and weather effects like snow and rain impede on your accuracy and mobility, and it really keeps you on your toes throughout the entire story campaign. And mission variety is surprisingly diverse. At one point, you're with the upper hand, performing reconnaissance at night on your enemies, and the next day, you're hanging on by a thread defending allied capture points as enemy tanks take turns making mincemeat out of your squad. And if you look in the server in the core for a long time, story and side content will run you close to about 60 hours, making this game fall in line with the longevity of some of the PSP Valkyria titles. And with that, I'd heartily recommend series veterans and newcomers to Valkyria Chronicles 4, even after the likes of some lackluster sequels that may have dissuaded some people since. From here, it's quite clear that the developers have clued back into why fans had fallen in love with the series in the first place, and Valkyria Chronicles 4 represents a shining beacon of hope for the future of the series, both in its mechanical and its creative philosophies. light that one of the most world famous video game review websites Polygon has started removing re scores from their reviews. It's a bit controversial and I'm really interested to talk about this so next to me I've got Jack and Jason to discuss what is a video game review and how do you get a good one without scores? Look okay so the the hardest part of course is that Pete we had there's a little thing that happened a few years ago. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was about gates. It was about gamers, mm. and it was about mm. ethics and video games journalism, right? So, so the, it, was it, it, it? Well, that, that therein lies the rub. Sure. But the, the question became, what does constitute a thing? And, and a lot of people kept saying, kept bragging that they would like, oh, we want more objectivity in our reviews. I'm like, well, then read the blurb on the back of the box. It's yeah. going to tell how many players you've got, what resolution is. That is an objective review. Mm. The game exists in this capacity. That that is the extent of an objective review. Unfortunately, the problem you face is that every game review, every single piece of opinion piece like that is subjective. It is by its very nature bias and it is by its very nature subjective. Well that was one of the biggest reasons why Polygon was saying that they were That's removing right. the scores from their reviews because like as games change, like how we talk about the games changes and we kind of need to keep up and not be mm. so kind of, I mean a, a big part of it was that games are, because they're being updated so often we can't just have the launch review That's right. and then like as a game like goes into its second, third, fourth, like how long has the Rainbow Six cycle, Siege been yeah. out for? The life like, cycle adapts over time and not only that, when games release there's always content updates, day on patches, games never really launch perfect now yeah. so they were saying their main points was that because they play the game to as much as capacity as they can and write something up on it that it's frowned upon to change a review post its mm. release so they put a they're trying to do a badge now a recommendation badge and i think that's supposed to adapt and change to uh give them a little bit of leeway when their review might not be accurate six to one year or even five years down well, the track i mean yeah. I, for them i think it's more of like we need to have some sort of quantitative measure of Correct. this is a good game like i love if, that if i'm if all about a score yeah, the the thing is, well, I mean, you were you want to keep the scores. I do. I'm Why? a big fan. Why I, though? I'm time poor. I don't like reading big essays. I love to scroll to the bottom and get that like categorization, pros and cons list, like IGN do. Yeah. And I love that you can sort of break it down by graphics, gameplay, and all that kind of stuff in a snapshot. The if I want issue, to read more, yeah. I will. The issue you face is that in games journalism specifically, and not that it's exclusive to us, but the game journalism, if you have a five out of five movie, it's not a perfect movie, there's no such thing as a perfect movie. Yeah. Any artistic thing, even a, even an inherently commercial one like video games, 
there's no such thing as a perfect video game. And yes, people will disagree with that hardy, hardy, hard. But they're wrong. It, it, basically, the idea is a five out of five is it is it is an important piece of cultural work, and you should watch it on the basis that it is important. And so you can not like it, yeah. but I still think you've got to recognize. And that's what a five out of five is like. And I think I mean I've given Game of the Years to games that we've got like sixes and sevens yeah. when we used to score. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm so passionate about that point because, honestly, it's rare for me to read a review that I truly agree with from yeah. the core. And half the time when a, game, an, a review is kind of average, I'll enjoy the game to its fullest extent more than the reviewer did. Yeah. And so, same with movies. You have to sort of play it and give it a crack and see what you think. I think the other one is you need to trust your reviewers. That, yeah. That's the other thing as well. Is yeah. and that, that Again, that goes back to the gates and the gamers and all that kind of stuff. Is that the trust is gone. The, the, the trust is dead, as far as, especially in video games. So, you need to trust that people are telling you, at the very least, they're being earnest in their opinion. Correct. You can agree with it, you can disagree with it, that's fine. Yeah. And I mean, like, if I get an email, like, I mean, I remember I got an email to do Halo 3 review, and someone just said, oh, Halo's shit. I'm like, why do you think it's shit? I know it's shit. I'm like, well, that's as much as that. Well, yeah. yeah. In, in it's like, like credibility at yeah. stake. It's, it's also, it also comes down to that kind of, like, distrust yeah. more broadly, I think, um, yeah. with people and media. Like, this isn't just, like, gaming. No, it's, like, of course So not. much of it is around, like, politics right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that more and more, and specifically, again, in, in what Plant, um, Chris Plant, the editor at Polygon wrote in this article was about like we want to try and make it more like more up to date because there are YouTubers coming on onto the scene and coming up with new ideas and All being the time. fresh and it's so saturated. More and more, the influencer is like there's less of a distance yeah. between the viewer and and the presenter in that mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. And I think that to be able to be a little bit more creative and a little bit more open ended in how those writers put that content out there, it's going to mean that people can kind of associate and, and like learn how they talk and how they I appreciate like games a bit more. Like this announcement has caught a lot of attention and all for great reasons for themselves. It's put them back on the map if they weren't already. And yeah. I think my, my thing is that if you drop a score from your game review, it affects your Google SEO. Yeah. So I was just going to have a ripple effect on their website. I mean, they're pretty famous, but... Yeah, yeah. And, and they are. They're Look, crazy. They're, they're one of those that... I mean, it's like the Kotaku's and, and those kind of people mm. where, yeah. like, they, they can kind of wear the hit a little bit. I mean, Gorka played the the algorithm for years. Like, they played the Google algorithm like yeah. a fiddle. But uh, it does affect Metacritic and and Metacritic. And this is, again, this goes back to that original issue is in get the gaming world, the the, the scale is uh, nine and a half to six. Yeah, if it's a six, it's a bad game. It's the worst game you've ever played. Yeah. And if it's a nine and a half, it's good. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, expectations. Yeah, and that is that is the problem. It's like if we're just going to do that, then what? Maybe a five star six music. But then you need to trust that the audience is going to interpret it that way, and they won't. Exactly. They'll they'll yeah. pick the minutia, they'll pick the stitches, and there won't be that thing. And I mean, like to be perfectly frank, that's why when Neo yeah, Plus started, I said we're not scoring reviews, and we got asked by Metacritic to join Metacritic. I thought we did when we started. But we, I, I, <laughs> much to my chagrin. Right, right. And then I had to fight him, and I said, no, we're not doing it anymore. Like, I'm sick of it. Yeah. So, to no. me, if I was going to see a scoring in a review, I want to see the full spectrum, and I want the hunt, like, out of 100, for example, I want yeah. it to be broken up into categories and accumulating into a type. See, that, score. that just turns it so much more into, like, let's tell a story of how quantitative this review is. Yeah. Like, 0 to 100, mm. I think, is by far the worst score. Like, 0 to 100, 0 to like a, like the po like a 0.5 yeah, scale yeah, is a joke. Yeah, yeah. 0 to 10 has been written like the 6 to 9.5, yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's a joke. I think 0 to 5 kind of works because okay, it's yeah. simplistic, it's very decisive. Yeah. Well, what does yeah. a 3 out of 5 even mean? It's a lukewarm game. Yeah. You it's, have it's 1 decent. and 2 yeah. is bad, yeah. 3 is lukewarm, yeah. 4 is a good game, and then 5 is this is a, a significant piece of culture that you really should mm. be on board with. And I think that that's a really easy way and to do it. And there can be 2s you enjoy. Like, I mean, I'll play games where fundamentally they're not good games. Idiot. Can be messy, Whoa. but no. But I'm just saying the review scores are not great. Right. I'm just, I'm just saying the review tapped. scores. Fine, <laughs> uh, but no, and it is exactly that. Whereas if you look at it Metacritic and like people go, oh, it's glitchy and it's buggy, and it's like, yeah, it's literally buggy because there's bugs in it. You should yeah, use. sharp Jack. Got him. Um, but like, but it is one of those things where, like, on a subjective level, I can really appreciate that as a game. Yeah. And there, there, there are better games in nearly every year that I play an EDF game, but I'll still put. Of two, course. two, three hundred hours into an EDF game yeah. every goddamn time. Mm. People buy Skyrim every single time it comes out. Like the 30th time. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with Dami. I'm waiting for the 3DS release. Yeah, yeah. Right. When you guys review video games, how hard is it for you to be objective versus subjective? I don't think that it's something that I really think about, to no. be honest. Like, sure. it's it's just like, this was my experience playing the game. Yep. These were some of the things that I think worked really well. Yep. This is what kind of fell flat. And it's, it's always within the context of what other games that I've played. And so using the language of like, oh, this is kind of like this other game, yep. being able to compare it to other stuff is a really easy way for... For, for me and for other people to like, oh, okay, I get kind of what you're talking about, particularly mm -hmm. on radio as well. And it's been going back, to, it goes back to that trust thing. I mean, I've been doing this 11 years, you know what I mean? At this point, 
even if you think I'm a fucking gronk, you know that I'm being honest. You know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah, telling you exactly right. what I think. <laughs> like, Blizzard suck, Bioware sucks, so don't give me any of their games. Because I'm not even going to pretend I can be objective enough to play it, mm. right? They're just, they're awful developers and I hate them. So I'm not going to pretend that I can play the game. See, but I can go, all right, I can see where, even if I did have to, like, let's, you know, you can, okay, I can see how they, see, this is what they were trying to do and whether they succeeded or not. They, like, for me, I will take a, an, like a flawed gem over a polished by committee, you know, perfect game every single day of the week. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, I don't, I can't remember a year where I gave a nine out of 10. No, I did. Uh, one I would consider a nine out of 10 was Wolfenstein. What I right, gave my yeah. game the Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein Two mm -hmm. are fantastic, but even then, where they failed is what makes the game great. Where you can see where they tried, and even if they missed what they were going for, I can appreciate that on its own level. And again, pure wank. Don't get me wrong, but it is new that game thing plus. of yeah, with new game plus. But it is <laughs> that thing of people have that trust that even if they disagree with me, even if they disagree with what I'm doing, they know that you're buying into what you're saying. And it's also a case of I don't think you're allowed. Like, not just you're allowed. I don't think you should have an opinion on anything beyond eh, I don't care. If you haven't watched it, if you haven't watched it or oh, played it or done anything, yeah, yeah, you can't say, "Oh, I think it's shit." No, you, you don't get to say that. Did you play? I, I have sat through series and read manga and played games that I fucking hated because I want to be able to say, "Here's where you're wrong." Yeah. You specifically, yeah. this is where you're wrong, yeah. and that makes me something of a pedant and a like. I yeah, mean, li fine. living out of spite. Oh. 100%. Well, I think you could say that's like very, very true, and you can tell when a journalist hasn't really played a game to its yeah. fullest fruition because the quality of the review doesn't stand up to the test of time of a game. It's a PR level. release, yeah. That's yeah. correct. And to be honest, I'm really looking forward to how this all unfolds and if it's success, if it's successful for Polygon. But at the end of the day, to me personally, I think scores have a place, ratings have a place, and I'm looking forward to the way uh, we continue to review our games here at New Game Plus. <laughs>Miraculously, it is time. After many angry emails and letters to Square Enix, they've finally done it. We have ourselves another home console Dragon Quest game. Not a 3DS game, not a portable game. Absolutely, get that stuff out of here. We're talking about Dragon Quest XI, and here I am, joined with our resident weeb, Shane. How are we doing? Not too bad. Yes, and we're going to be talking about the nuances of the latest home console JRPG craze that is Dragon Quest. So, basically jumping straight into it, you're thrown in, and guess what? You're the hero. Who would have thunk it? It's a Dragon Quest game, and you're the hero. The hero is the Luminary. The Luminary is like a hero of light who will banish all darkness. Who would have thunk it again? But hey, it's still a Dragon Quest game. The story there just kind of actually speeds up very, very fast at the start, and it's really, really tense. Mm. And it does it really, really well just to throw you in and like, make sure you actually really want to continue. That said, it does slow down after the first maybe four or five hours. Yep. But that's a Dragon Quest game. You yes. Can... It is a, in, in essence, it is a JRPG, mm. and you're going to get that. You're going to get some really excellent pacing at the start, um, and then it will peter out into a grind fest later on. Mm -hmm. That is not, not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's, very, it's, very, it's, it's a personality quirk yes. of a JRPG. But the... There's an interesting like sense of uh, of, uh, of intrigue as well as uh, as uh, like I guess politically charged just happenings when it mm. comes to this game where um, you as the luminary um, who is set to banish all evil and bring restore or restore um, points to or like restore light to uh, the world to the world in general yes. um, is is kind of succeeded by a lot of people like trying to get in through personal gain a lot of soldiers a lot of uh, warlords and kings trying to kind of just banish you for their own personal gain so. Again, there's there's a lot of interesting things going on there, interesting sense of crit uh, intrigue. But I mean, with the story out of the way, we're going to be talking about the presentation because the presentation is absolutely nuts. Mm. The game itself is so pretty. Like it comes from a 3DS game, so you're thinking maybe they're going to have a few like texture issues or something like that. Just something that's going to be a little bit, eh. Mm. No, it looks amazing, and Akira Toriyama's art style comes across really, really well on the PS4 and the PC, which does have a lot of graphics options also, which makes it really much, much more pretty. Mm. It's one of those like manga style art styles that really translate really mm. well into the field of 3D, and yeah. you know it kind of earns its chops in its 2D realm as well. Um, but like the game looks absolutely great. The um, the draw distance is, is absolutely superb. Fantastic texture work. Good like anti aliasing mm. and, and shading. Um, the only thing I have to have an issue with with the presentation. Um, um, is the actual music itself. It's fairly unmemorable. That's the thing, like, it is safe. Is safe is probably the it's right word to put safe it. safe is and, the right word. And Dragon Quest has always been known to be safe, so maybe it came across 
through that kind of thing where they yeah. just weren't going to make something extraordinary. Like, mm, if you yeah. think about, you know, Final Fantasy XV, there's still some songs that I can remember in my head, even yeah. though I hated most of that game, <laughs> except for the gameplay <laughs> and the music, but hey. Yes, but um, I guess not all sound design is bad either, because mm. uh, with this introduction of the English localization, we do have full voice acting. Yes. Well, you know, for, for some NPCs, they'll have a few tracks here and there. But I love just how worldly each accents are. So you've have got you've got people that have like Brooklyn accents in your team, in your party, mm. and then you've got like real thick Cockney accents in it, and it's great because it feels so worldly. Like it's it's got it's the Xenoblade Chronicles two argument of like there's so many accents everywhere, and it makes the universe seem a lot bigger than it actually is. I feel like the one thing that is slightly, maybe not a letdown, but it's a kind of variation is that Akira's Toriyama art style doesn't really suit the kind of nationalism that their voice acting kind of went for. A lot of the characters that I feel like, oh, were French, that I thought, you don't kind of look French, but okay. But then there's like, then there's the main character that is very much French and he, his voice is very much French. So it's like, yes, yes. it's a hit and miss there a little bit, which I mm. kind of felt like they could have maybe worked on a little bit better. Yeah. But. Combat wise, it's um, it's a fairly interesting fair. Like, you know, it's solid in its implementation. Mm. There's some really cool things involved, but um, in for the most part, it, it is fairly conservative. Yeah. That's not a bad thing. I know that's a very bad word among, among many circles, but the way you do combat, um, I think uh, there's a couple of additions in particular, like in the overworld, you actually do get to sprint, so you don't need to rely on horses mm -hmm. too much anymore, which is fantastic, and it's in exclusive to the English localization. There's also an interesting way in which you can use a free camera and free movement within combat, but it's more of a uh, it's more of a cos purely cosmetic thing rather than that. So you'll find yourself switching back to the classic mode immediately. Yep. But the combat is great; it's solid. Um, you know, you got to work on like you know uh, magic weaknesses, physical weaknesses. Um, you have proficiencies of like pole arms, staves, yeah. uh, swords, things like that. But that's where I think one of the kind of weaknesses of just this game comes in is the just the progression in your skill points or yes. your your skill tree. So every mm, character mm. is basically a set class. You've got like you know your weapons and then this one kind of small like skill tree to each yep. character. And you really do need to commit to the bit too. Yeah. So if you sit there going like, well, because of the the amount of SP that you gain is so slim and yeah. absolutely tiny. Like you can grind for two hours and you can still have like ten SP and you go, wow, this doesn't seem like much of a return. Yeah. So the game demands a lot of time, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a drag. Dragon Quest game, and you are probably going to spend about 100 to 200 hours. So it's all on the tin. Like yeah. you're, if you expect anything, anything less, that's absolutely silly. But when it all comes down to it, Dragon Quest 11 is, you know, it's it's a fairly solid approach. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to have a home console uh, localization back again in a timely manner or timely enough. And it's great for people, especially for people who you know want their very first um, foray into JRPG. Yeah. So it's good for kids, yeah. good for young adults, and good for everyone else in between. Maybe not kids, because there's a lot of like, you know, the, the puff puffs. Oh, the puff puff, right. The thing that stuck with me from Matt's review of Dragon Quest XI is just this idea of it being comfort food, of Dragon Quest as a whole not really changing in its many, many, many iterations. It's more than XI, by the way. But like it's remained sort of this constant thing where you can just go back to any game and just get a very similar but comforting experience. God, it looks good on PlayStation 4 though. That too, yes. Yeah. Like they certainly put in all stops in terms of um, the production quality, or most of the production quality of that game mm -hmm. anyway. But Meg, what's a, what, what would be some comfort food gaming for you? The Sims, please don't judge yeah. me. Uh, Stardew Valley, anything that has no time associated with it, I can just play it continuously for always and wreck marriages and, you know, take up new jobs that I've always <laughs> wanted to be like an astronaut. I'm all about it. Just a professional home wrecker, maybe. <laughs> I mean, like with The Sims, like you can just destroy the house around The Sims, so literal home wrecking. Agreed. Yeah. But for my personal um, comfort food games, like it used to be the trading card games like Magic and Hearthstone. Nice. But they became competitive. I got a little bit too competitive with those, so I had to put them away. Really? So it brought out something in you that you didn't like? Like, it, like the salt was very real. <laughs> but Don't like losing? <laughs> I just like yeah, I just like winning a lot. Fair to say. But nowadays though, I keep on coming back to Rock Band and Rock Band 4, especially since the game now has this concept of seasons. Really? Where you and a band can come together and just try to be the best you can in wait, songs. Wait, wait. Are you a mad shredder? Like what's your like 
a weapon of choice? Well, guitar, obviously. Of course. Like, nice. having played that series since Guitar I Hero that 1. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, like, so I've been playing that, those games for well over a decade now. So it's just good to, like, every now and then, just to, especially when I'm feeling angry, yeah. just break out the plastic drums and just thrash them Metal. like nobody's business. Do you reckon they'll ever make another one, even if it's Guitar Hero? What do you think? No, I think, I think that's, that franchise's time has come and gone. But we still have Rock Band 4 nowadays, which is True. fine by just me. Just dance a million. I kind of want to play that now. So I'm just going to go and going to go over there now. Thank you very <laughs> much for watching New Game Plus this week. If you want to watch more of our videos, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and we even have our own website at www.newgameplus.tv. Don't forget to watch NPG RPG. That comes up right after this. In the meantime, thank you very much, Meg. My pleasure. And we'll see you next week. You said NPG again. <laughs> I actually said it in my head first and then <laughs> said it wrong. You can see it click over and I was like, I'm just going to do it. Can I do a voiceover for it?